Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we have Dr. Kyle Pfaffenbach with us from Eastern Oregon University from the Brooks Beast. He's got athletes going to the Olympic trials here soon and possibly even the Olympics really soon. It's exciting times. And thanks for joining us in finals week, Kyle. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough week to join us. We're going to talk about protein for cyclists, sodium loading, fructose, and other stuff. So stay tuned if you're interested in any of that stuff and how it can make you faster. Let's go straight into Ian's question. He says, I've heard you guys talk a lot about sodium intake, obviously. I haven't heard you mention sodium bolusing, which he's talking about like preloading with a lot of it in one sitting, uh, before a hard event, such as what is being recommended by, and he mentions Dr. James Nicolantonio, I believe is how you pronounce the name. There's a book called the salt fix when I think that he has, he recommends large sodium loads of two to four plus grams about an hour before exercise to increase plasma volume and improve performance. Any thoughts on this? Uh, thanks Kyle. The first thing that stands out to me is number one, I'm curious to see if you recommend this for your athletes, but I, and this is due to my own misunderstanding or my own lack of understanding. I feel like a huge bolus like that just before to increase plasma volume from what I understand, I th doesn't that take longer than just like an instant, like boom, plasma volumes up. Cause I took in a bunch of salt. Uh, no, it actually does work like this. Um, which is oh, cool. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of interesting. The, the, um, I have to remember there's some European papers on this. It's, there's a guy, I'm absolutely, uh, the, there's a person, I'm absolutely going to butcher their name. So there's, uh, Goulet, G-O-U-L-E. And I think there's an apostrophe in there somewhere. Um, so, uh, they, that person is in that group has done a couple papers and then there's a, there's an author that starts with a P. This is so bad. Uh, I'm trying to pull this like out of memory <laughs> of the hundreds of articles that I read in uh, pure pure lay or something like this. I anyways, so the these are called hyperhydration protocols, and the idea is that if you take a whole bunch of salt with a whole bunch of water, that's the key. And that um, so the way I explain this to, to athletes or, or people that I'm talking to, to try and just, just make it simple is that we're, the body does sort of like the, it, it defends a ratio of salt to water. So if you take on a bunch of water without any salt, you'll end up flushing the water and, and it's actually, it's, it's counterintuitive. So th this is one of the reasons why I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here, but this is one of the reasons why urine color is not a great indicator of hydration status, even though we all kind of do it either consciously or subconsciously. Take a piss, you see it's bright yellow, you think, oh, I need to get hydrated. Drink a whole bunch of plain water, 45 minutes later, an hour later, you pee and it's clear and you think I'm hydrated. And you're not it's not necessarily putting you in hydration. You're just flushing all the water you drank because you just took on a whole bunch of water without any salt. If, if, and you end up having to pee some of that as your kidneys, like uh, kind of play catch up and things like that. So, so the kidneys are basically either retaining sodium or retaining water or flushing water and, or trying to flush sodium. And there's a whole balance there and it's actually really accurate. Uh, it just takes some time. And so we, we typically get it right on a 24 hour basis. And so we really try and think about hydration on like an overall basis, not a moment to moment basis. Okay. So having said all of that, if you take on a bunch of water with a bunch of salt, there is some evidence that you will retain more of that water and you can increase your plasma volume. And so, and this really seems to be, um, most beneficial when you're getting ready to exercise in the heat and, and other people there, there's been other, um, Who's the woman that does stuff? Um, <laughs> she had a company that was all based around like electrolytes. Uh, 
Dr. Simpson? Yeah, 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 yeah. And she, what was, she had an old company. I don't think it exists anymore, but uh, she had an old company that was really based around a lot of these ideas. And and she had a product called Preload or that company had a product called Preload. And I think it was around two grams of sodium and you take it with a whole bunch of water before exercising in the heat. And for some people, and, and there are some studies that would suggest that this does improve performance in the heat and that you can increase your plasma volume. I think the the other thing that is interesting is um, glycerol. So uh, g glycerol, which is just like the three carbon structure, it's a backbone for triglycerides. It's it's a very simple molecule. The organic structure of it's very simple. Uh, it's used as a thickener in a lot of like baked goods, a lot of commercially processed foods. Um, it's used in shampoos and lotions and things like that. It's kind of a gooey substance when it's in its sort of liquid form. And so you can, you can put vegetable glycerin or glycerol into water and that glycerol increases water retention as well. So the the Glay paper that I was referring to, if I'm saying that name correctly, it, this is widely available. It's a, it's a hyperhydration protocol where it's this super aggressive fluid. Um, it's a very, very aggressive fluid, salt, and glycerol kind of cocktail, if you will, that he that that group demonstrated can can increase plasma volume and there could be some advantages to this uh particularly when exercising in the heat it's less clear if it's beneficial when you're not exercising in the heat and the role of it uh, when a person is heat adapted is also unclear to me. Uh, maybe someone else has it all figured out. So because one of the things that happens when we exercise in the heat for a week or two, or you do post-exercise sauna or those types of things, you do one of the one of the main acclimations that we get is an increase in plasma volume. Um, we also lower the temperature at which we start sweating. There's a little bit of evidence that, that we may reduce the saltiness of our sweat a little bit by increasing sodium reabsorption as the as it's as the fluid is headed towards the the sweat gland and and up to the cell surface or to the skin surface. So there's a lot of moving parts here. So the question is like, yeah, maybe like it's super interesting. Um, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the the book that um, uh, that he that Ian cited. Um, and it, you know that sounds more. Uh, it, I don't know. You said the book is called The Salt Fix, comma, Win. And like that seems like an over a little bit of an over promise to me. But I do think <laughs> that uh better understanding a person's like salt dynamics, their salt intake, their sweat saltiness, uh, what they can do, especially when it's hot to uh preload and do you know, they call it hyperhydration protocols. And we have absolutely used things like this, especially when it's really hot, especially when you're going for a next CO or longer. Um, this is the kind of thing that that kind of gives you. Now, you do carry more weight to the starting line, right? And so that has to, you have to like think about, can I handle that mentally? Do I understand why I'm going to the line? Like this is something that you talk about too when a person's like fully glycogened up and those sorts of things. And so it's not, you're carrying a little bit more to the line. You're going to feel that a little bit, but you're weighing the the payoff potentially of buffering that, whatever that critical number is for people, some say 2%, some say 3%, some say 5% of body weight loss during an effort due to, uh, fluid loss before there's a big performance drop. I think that's also very individual. So it's really mm -hmm. about taking sort of that information and contextualizing it f with your sweat rate, your sweat saltiness, how well you do with the heat, how likely you are, how much you experience cramps, when those cramps occur during different types of efforts. And when you put all that together, um, you can absolutely kind of experiment with this. So I think it's it's really interesting. I, I'd like more, I'd like there to be more studies on this. There's really only a few groups looking at it. Um, and, and I think it's, yeah, I think it, it's very 
Interesting. I have two thoughts. Well, I, I have a lot of questions that, that just yeah, came yeah. up from listening to you talk about that, Kyle. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out here is putting two to four grams in context. That's a lot. Like, um, so like, for example, if you get Precision Hydration makes a product called pH 1500. Okay. Yeah. And they have effervescent tablets that you can drop into a drink. That's you have true. to drop two of the pH fifteen hundred tablets into what whatever vessel you're drinking from in order to get fifteen hundred milligrams of sodium. Uh, if you do that and put it into like a even like give yourself like a, some some extra room for dilution and give yourself like a seven hundred and fifty milliliter bottle, so not like a small yeah. cycling bottle, but the ones that are a little bit taller. And I still, I promise you, that will feel like you're drinking the ocean. It is yes. really, really salty. And that's 1,500. I cannot There's imagine other, doing so, two to four. S- sorry. Uh, the I have another point for context. Uh, so ju- just to, in one teaspoon of salt, there's two 2,350 milligrams. So that's two grams. Um. It, that is the RDA for salt intake for an adult for the entire day. And to your point <laughs> with the precision, so now we're talking about doing twice the amount of RDA into a bottle just for prehydration. That's not counting the salt you put on your food and the salt that you're going to drink while you're on the bike. So it really is for like a very specific purpose of like this idea of loading. And you have to have the right amount of water with the proper amount of salt. It can't just be like two grams of, you can't just eat a spoon of a, a teaspoon of salt and you're good, it has to come with a certain amount of water. So that's the thing that Ian didn't kind of mention is you you can't have this conversation about salt amount unless you're talking about it in the context of the amount of water. And this does, like, once you get your head around the conversions and the relationship between those things, the the reason why pH, um, and and I've worked with pH before, Uh, we actually, my lab at, at Eastern Oregon is one of the only places in the Northwest with the, with the full testing equipment. Um, I think there's only about 30, 28 or so places in North America that, that have that equipment and we're lucky enough to have it. Those guys are awesome. And, uh, or that team is awesome. Um, and so the the reason why they made that and they call it 1500 but it actually has 750 milligrams of salt is because it's meant to go in 500 milliliters of water and when you put 750 milligrams of salt into 500 mils of water it makes a 1500 milligram per liter concentration yeah and so this is the thing that that kind of we 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 really like spent some time walking through this so <clears throat> i've actually had quite a few athletes coming over from boise recently and they they make the drive over to where we are and they um they get the the precision hydration test and we talk about some of their upcoming efforts and things like that there's a big ultra community ultra running community in boise so we've been doing that and uh So one of the things that's interesting is we do the salt test and we find out, okay, like some, this can vary really widely, right? Like, so people can lose, let's say 1200 milligrams of salt uh, per liter of sweat loss. And then you have to start figuring out, well, what's my sweat rate? So if I'm... Uh, if I'm a well, it, if I'm heat adapted and it's hot outside, I can easily lose a liter and a half of sweat per hour. So now I'm losing 1800 milligrams of salt per hour and for a salty sweater. And if I'm exercising for three or four hours, this is like really adding up. Now, here's the thing that that is not what Ian is talking about. That's just thinking about replacement and hydration and trying to like, that's sort of a, and you're never going to be like one in one out. You're never going to match hydration. You're just trying to prevent, you know, usually the rule of thumb that most nutritionists use is 3% total body weight loss. So you take your body weight, you figure out how many pounds is 3%. And then after that, there, there's a, 
a relation, this is very controversial, but, but there's a relationship, some studies have suggested a relationship between like pretty significant performance drop off because as your plasma volume begins to dip, your there's less fluid going through the same pipes and so but but there's a certain amount of blood flow that is demanded for the effort that you're doing and so what happens is the the pump has to increase to to keep that blood flow going and so you get this thing that it's been it's referred to as cardiac drift where you know at at a certain wattage when it's hot, you'll see as time goes on, the heart rate to maintain that sort of drifts up as you're losing water. And we can kind of blunt some of that when you increase your plasma volume. And so there's kind of a lot to this. You got your salt sweatiness, you got your sweat rate, and then you also have whether you're preloading for hyperhydration, then you have to plan what you're going to do on the bike then you kind of need some insight into how much salt you lose per liter of sweat and how many liters of sweat you lose per hour. Um, and it it clicks after you think about it for a while, but it, it's not intuitive straight straight away. Yeah, and then you have to factor in how many carbs you need to be taking and then balance all of that in with it. It's pretty. It's a complex problem to solve. Nate, I, as I recall, you were a high-volume sweater and then also a salty sweater. I don't know if you recall. When I was like you... medium-high on the salt, but then a high volume of, of water. Yeah, I was like two liters an hour or something or more. But yeah. I'm, I'm tall, right? There's a lot of surface area, and the yeah, water so we... used to be high. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do <laughs> see that. We see two to three... Um, liters per hour, especially if you're heat trained and, um, like, so you're talking about like, so, so one liter it is sucks. one kilogram and one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So you're talking about six pounds an hour. You know, you're trying to, if you weigh 160, I don't know, I'm ballparking it. If, if you're weigh one, 165, 170, that's only about, you can only afford to lose what? seven or eight pounds um before and you're losing six pounds an hour six point whatever pounds an hour like it's the the math is very difficult this is where the the argument kind of comes from about like oh that three percent body weight is is doesn't work because we see often uh very elite marathoners and very elite cyclists that are doing really long stages, they're finishing 10, 12 pounds uh, below their starting body weight, and they're still performing really well at the end of that. And so, but the the thing is, is like none of this occurs in a vacuum, right? It depends on fitness, it depends on efficiency, it depends on food intake, it depends on uh, central nervous yeah, system training. It... Hey, Kyle, I'm sorry to jump in, but on that one too, are they, they're, they've gotta be less on glycogen also, and I don't think they take into account that in their calculation for weight loss. It's always think it's just water. Just water. Yep. Yeah, it's a good point. And but and I mean, it should so, be glycogen too. They're, yeah, they've lost more weight because of glycogen. Yeah. Yep. And and so it is like the thing that can really be. So the the precision hydration thing is pretty interesting because there's people that will say that you can't make the assumptions that they make based off the wrist. So so what what's unique about their process is that they stimulate your sweat glands when you're in a non-exercising state. And then what we do is is we stimulate your sweat glands um uh and then collect that sweat and it's like a really clean quote unquote clean sample of sweat that you can get and then analyze with a with like a research grade sodium analyzer. And outside of that, the other sort of like gold standard is more of a field test where you actually take gauze and you wrap it in tegaderm and then you go train for a certain amount of time. And then you take this sweat patch, which is just sweat soaked, like non-absorbent gauze and wring it out into a test tube and and then you take that sample and you put it into a little ion analyzer so these they have ion analyzers that that um are actually used by like water treatment people and people that are like testing water sources and things like that it's like a pocket size thing and you take a little droplet of so so you can utilize that for sweat and there's been papers published on this and stuff like that lindsay baker is like she's the person that you want to read about when you're reading about hydration she's just like 
really, really, really good like studies, methodologies, um, all the different uh, variety of nuances. It's not just like, a, oh, yeah, do this and your hydration problems are solved. She's very interesting. Um, and so, um, so you take... Uh, so that's the other way to do it. The, the, the precision hydration way just gives you this, uh, it gives you this ballpark number that seems to solve a lot of issues and it gives us a really good starting point. So like Nate said, he found out, oh, okay, I'm a medium salty sweater. What does that even mean? I, it, typically that's going to be somewhere between 600 and 800 milligrams of salt per liter, but where it'll catch up with him is if he's a three two two liter an hour uh, salt sweat person. Now all of a sudden that becomes a lot of salt, even though the salt per liter isn't as high as we've seen before. And and we do this a lot with. Um, it's super fun work. We do it with uh, wildland firefighters, um, and it's really, really helped that we have like this elite group of um, repel firefighters here that we have this ongoing nutrition and research program with. And the because the standard now is just carry three Nalgenes of water. That's like what the Forest Service recommends for firefighters that are in full PPE like working anywhere from eight to 12 hour shifts on a line in really hot conditions with potentially a round like fire in the middle of the summer. Um, and so we've, we've gotten almost everybody on that rappel crew through and they range from 400 milligrams per liter salt loss to, I think the highest I saw was 1650, um, per liter. And then what you have to do is go exercise for an hour or two, do pre-post weight. Um, you, you know, I, I think that's good enough for the ballpark. Yeah, there's a glycogen consideration that you, but, you know, without Doppler and, and ultrasound and things like that, it's hard to tell how much glycogen depletion has occurred and run those calculations stuff. So you just do pre-post weight, um, naked, toweled off, pre-post and and then you just take that and you get generally what your sweat rate is under those conditions. And that puts you in the game as far as like getting it close. And with hydration, it is like, it's exactly inexact. Like you, you have to get close, but close is good enough. Mm. Yeah. This feels like a situation where like, if people are going to do the pre post measurement, cause like you pointed out, Nate, it is crucial how much glycogen you've lost. And if you're doing a tour de France stage and you're like one of these like high performance athletes, you're draining a huge amount of glycogen. So if you are doing this sort of thing, it might make sense to pair it with something that's just like in, you know, in normal hot conditions that you would be in, but you're doing something that's low intensity. Kyle, I have, I have a question though. We've, that 3% point is commonly referenced. Assuming yeah. that, let's say I weigh 150 pounds, but then yeah. I sodium load with the appropriate amount of, of liquid as well. And as a result, I've gained an additional five, six pounds beforehand. Yeah. If So this may seem silly here, but I bet somebody has this question. Is that 3% now not relevant because I've increased Correct. my body weight and I basically have 3% down from my original body weight that I can go to, so it gives me more margin for error? Or Correct. is that relative to the starting point regardless of what my baseline was prior to sodium loading? I don't know if it's, that makes sense. It's, it, for me, it's always been relative to your morning weight. So, so you would wake up, take a piss, weigh yourself. From there, you have 3% to play with. That's that's what we've God. always gone off of, um, and that's my understanding of it. If if somebody like has really clear data on that, and and honestly, that three percent is like it's a guess. Like some people are like, no, I can do way more than that. Some people are like, yeah, but you know, a couple of years ago there was a uh, this whole thing about electrolyte. You know, things just like with macronutrients and different macronutrients, stuff with electrolytes ebbs and flows in terms of its importance of different things and. And I remember hearing one time about, um, uh, I was at a running store giving a talk and, and a gentleman was telling me that he was taking like two or three salt stick tablets, every aid station during a marathon and 
drinking a bunch of water with it too. And he like weighed more at the end of a marathon than he did at the beginning of it because of how much <laughs> like water he was retaining. Right. And so, so it's not just something where you can go like, oh, they talked about this and, and electrolytes are good. I'm just going to like drink all the element and drink all the pH 1500 and do this sort of thing. You really need to have some insight about what it is that that works for you if you're trying to dial this in. Um, and again, that 3% is just sort of like, uh, for me, what it does is it really helps figure out how much liquid people need to get per hour on the bike in certain situations, particularly racing situations. Because you're trying to like drink as little as you can and get away with it um, because you're trying to carry there's logistics there's not always opportunities to drink you may drop a bottle in a feed zone you have so you have to like consider all these like the variety of contingencies and so we kind of set uh like you have to get this you can also listen to your thirst now i know there's a little bit of controversy about how like our thirst mechanism actually works really well particularly when we're at rest and there's a little bit of confusion about like you know you hear old adages and things like that like if you wait till you're thirsty to drink on the bike, it's already too late. It might not be because of a thirst thing. It could be because of this water lot, because of your sweat rate. And there's a bunch of like things like that. So, but you can be like, oh man, water would taste so good right now. Or flat Coke would taste so good right now. And you can, so you can listen to your cravings on the bike. We don't want to ignore those things. But then there's also this like minimum that we want to set where we say like, yeah, we got to get this much in or or we're just a, it's just a ticking time bomb. Um, is any of this relevant? Like, it's I feel just, like I'm going off on all kinds yeah. of tangents here, especially from the original question. So if you guys need to rein me back in, just say, <laughs> like, just, yeah. <laughs> to put that original one in context of the four grams, a McDonald's large fries is 300 milligrams. So it's more than 10 <laughs> times more than the amount of sal salt that this yes. author wow. is saying have in an hour one hour before your wait was that I'm, 300 I'm guessing, was that 300 milligrams, milligrams? so we're talking yeah. about grams though nate like we're talking about two yeah so that would be four thousand milligrams would yeah. be the what this author is saying so 300 or 300 versus four thousand one hour before daily rides um it makes me think kyle of like would there be any impact doing this long term on blood pressure or like hypertension with that much salt like that's a lot of salt that's more than a i've lot. heard anyone ever say so so but before i answer that let's just back up for a second and and also say that one of those salt packets that you get from a fast food place that you crack over they're like the white salt packets that you crack open those are two thousand milligrams so just put this in context. So yeah, the fries may come out of the fryer with that much, but as soon as you crack that sole thing and put that on there, you're, you could be up to two, 2,300 or 2,600 pretty quick. Um, so, so that's just something to like take into consideration. The, the second thing is, is that the hyperhydration protocol with glycerol and sodium combination with fluid it's super aggressive. So it's 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. So if you Whoa. are, yeah, so that's how much fluid. So like what, Nate, what's your weight right now? Just ballpark. Uh, 205. Okay. So divide that by 2.2 2 is 93 kg times 30. So that's 2.8 liters of water. And they say <laughs> you need 7.5 grams of salt per liter. That's this much right here. Okay. <laughs> so, and then this is 2.8 saying... liters of water right here. Almost okay. a gallon. 2.8 liters, of, so almost a gallon of water with, and then they say 7.5 grams of salt per liter. So this person's saying four grams. Whoa. They're saying 15 <laughs> grams for you. Oh my goodness. Right? More than 15 grams of salt. And then like a whole bunch of glycerol. And they're saying, drink all that down 
give it two, three hours, and then you're like ready to roll. So some of this stuff is just not like plausible, <laughs> right? It's just not plausible. Oh gosh. And they were trying to, they were doing this for a study. They were trying to get a physiologic response. They were trying to show you're going to have different people. Like you just want to... <laughs> Almost said a really bad pun there, but um, you want to take these things into context. (laughs) You want to take these things into context when you're doing it and sort of make your own adjustments to figure out and, and definitely don't try this before your big race for the first time or something like that. You tried on an easy day, you tried in a workout, then you tried in a low grade race and then you, then you make sure you're fully dialed. And so there's things that you have to take into consideration for that. And then the second thing is, um, j- just so we know now the volumes and the different amounts of water and, and salt that we're talking about. Yeah, I do think there's implications uh, in terms of people that are either genetically predisposed for hypertension or already currently have hypertension. You have to take those things into consideration. One of the reasons why um, managing salt intake is so important is not because of the salt itself. It's because it it does impact plasma volume and plasma volume impacts blood pressure and stress on the heart and those sorts of things. Because if you have more plasma volume, you know, theoretically, you're going to have more stroke volume. You're going to have more left ventricular stretching, definitely during exercise. Um, and it's just a more, it's, it's, you're putting the, you're, you're, if when you put more fluid into the same system and you turn the pump up, i.e. the heart, it's you're putting your thumb over the water hose, right? It's it's you have vasoconstriction, you have an increase in mean arterial pressure. So now you have reduced volume, but more fluid, and now everything's under higher pressure. And so you absolutely have to take those things into consideration. And then the last thing to to really think about is is there are different people with different sensitivities to salt and fluid retention, especially when it comes to like ankle swelling, toe swelling, edema, fluid accumulation, um, those sorts of things. So like some of you have may have experienced this, you drink a bunch of water and, and beer and eat a super salty pizza. And the next day you wake up and you're, you're not just hung over. You're also like puffy. And even let's say, let's take alcohol out of the equation. You just eat some stuff that's super salty and 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 let's say you get takeaway pizza that has 1,500 milligrams of salt per slice and you eat four slices and drink a bunch of water. You wake up the next day and your your rings are maybe a little Mm -hmm. tighter. Your your watch is leaving bands. Your socks are leaving rings around your... Like that's... Those are all signs of edema and all signs of, of things that are basically like... Le- suggesting that you may not be super great at getting a ton of salt, excess salt out of the system. So you're retaining a lot of fluid. Does this make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that I feel I've done for, uh, but I do a much smaller dosage of this. So I usually have like a pH 1500 tablet. So that's 750 milligrams of sodium again yeah. uh, in like a cycling bottle in a 500 mil bottle. And I'll drink that two to three hours before a race. And at Cape Epic or any sort of stage race, single track six last year, I would do that before I went to bed and I would do it in the morning. And what I found is what I've found, at least in experimenting myself personally, is that that does set me up to have less check engine light moments. Right. And yep. like, uh, you know, as long, that's not the only thing, of course, there's a lot of other stuff going on and we're making sure we have adequate carbohydrate intake and we're doing all those other things. But I guess the, the reason I'm bringing that up is that you don't start out with two to four, like no. start out with something smaller that you can manage and you can experience and see if it does seem to help you. And then you can kind of go from there. So, so just in terms of like applying this from like a very, very basic like where where do I start if if you were just gonna blindly give somebody a place to start? It's actually exactly what you just described, uh, Jonathan, which is somewhere between five hundred and seven hundred and fifty milligrams of salt in five hundred mils, so in a half a liter, which is close to sixteen ounces as well. So it's basically a pint glass filled to the brim with either you can just do like a quarter of a teaspoon of salt 
or you could do something like a product that doesn't have a lot of um, artificial sweeteners and and does have some salt and tastes pretty good is called Kinderlight. That that product, I, I'm not affiliated with them at all. Precision hydration. Also, you can do the pH 1500 or the pH 500. And then also a lot of people, yeah, try like something like liquid IV. Uh, and then there's also um, the... I don't know if it's element or if it's LMNT. I don't know what you say, but it's twice as much as a Kinderlight and one and a half times as much as a pH fifteen hundred. So again, I said this was simple, but and now I'm bogging it down in details. But the the whole point is, <laughs> is if you drink five hundred mils with a reasonable amount of electrolytes, somewhere between five hundred and seven hundred fifty milligrams of electrolytes, you do that in the morning. You do that an hour before training. And you do that either at dinner or at night after dinner. From there, off the bike, you can drink to thirst. And and if you're craving salt, put some electrolytes in it. You can mix in a little bit of plain water. I hear a lot of very, very prescriptive hydration that from a day-to-day -day basis, like you need 90 ounces, you need whatever, you need 3.5 liters, you need, you know, there are some recommendations in mils per kilogram. I think it's around 50 mils per kg or maybe 30 mils per kg, somewhere in that range, like 30 to 50 mils per kg is like a good starting point for total fluid intake. But the point is, is that if you're being proactive about it in terms of you get it first thing in the morning with some electrolytes and some water, you get it prior to training, you have an idea of what you need when you're on the bike based on sweat rate and temperatures and things like that. And then you drink to thirst and intentionally get one in the evening with electrolytes in a drink. That's a totally reasonable place to start. And you kind of go from there based on how you're feeling and those types of things. One of the things that is, I think, interesting is that if you do add some salt, whether it's just uh, salt or, or if it's one of the products that we're talking about before you go to bed or in the evening after dinner, uh, I do think it helps retain some of that water and and we this is anecdotal but people seem to have to get up less to pee in the middle of the night when they're making sure they're on top of hydration because that that electrolyte with water balance helps us retain that water yeah it makes sense well kyle thanks for the deep dive on the sodium side of things uh nate it's interesting to get your perspective considering that you know you're not putting out huge training volume every day and you're not having to worry about this quite as much you know, the health implications of doing this. I think if you're listening to this, you can't just go hog wild. So, well, yeah, I have one more question for Kyle. I think yeah. people have this question because you said increasing plasma volume, you know, increases blood pressure and then it impacts on your heart and stuff. But we also know that training can increase plasma volume. So, can heat adaptation. And I know that actually, though, helps blood pressure long term. Can you explain how that kind of relationship works? I don't know if this is your area of expertise, but I, uh, I think people will be like, wait, is training bad for me now with the blood pressure? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's such a good point. So this is not my area of expertise. Um, having said that, there's multiple things at play here. One is basically the flexibility and adaptability. That they call this vascular function. So the ability of your vasculature to vasodilate and vasoconstrict, depending on the demands of the system, is really important. And so one of the things that can happen, for example, when we heat train, after that initial stress and after we get the adaptation of increased plasma volume, one of the things that people see is, is a lower resting heart rate. And that's because you have more fluid in the system, but it takes less pumps to meet the blood flow demand at baseline. And so you have a lower heart rate uh, under, and, and you, we can also see this to a certain extent where like there's a lower heart rate at certain intensities after a person's been heat adapted because of increased uh, plasma volume. It's, it's one of the explanations for that. So in terms of um, overall, exercise is really good for vascular function. It, it creates like some of our vasculature vasodilates to get 
increase blood flow to exercising muscles. Uh, some of our vasculature vasoconstricts because the tissues that are fed by that vasculature are in less need of blood flow during exercise, and we're trying to shunt blood to specific places. And exercising your vasculature like that does seem to be very important. And one of the things that can occur is is we lose less functionality as we age, and um, and as it's associated with certain like inflammatory states or, or metabolic diseases or those types of things. And so hypertension is like this really interesting thing that's not, I don't know if there's just like one thing we can point to um, in, in sort of when you talk about hypertension, like at a very basic, like at the, when I talk about chronic diseases in my 200 level nutrition class, the textbook really just says like hypertension isn't like fully explained by one thing. There's not just one mechanism that leads to it. We just know that it's something that it has uh, genetic factors, has lifestyle factors, has exercise factors, has age-related factors, and we know it's associated with adverse cardiac events and other metabolic diseases. So we see it a lot of times with people with everything from type 2 diabetes to atherosclerosis to those types of things. And it's, it's probably this complex issue that that takes into account all these things. So overall, I don't think the the ability to increase plasma volume through nutritional strategies is not something that it it may give you some marginal gains and it may help you with your hydration on the bike and prevent things like cramping and bonking and dehydration and those types of things. I might be overstating the the adaptations to a point where you're now putting your body under undue stress because you've like tripled your plasma volume or something like that. It's, it's, it's not, my understanding is it's not really like that. So no, the working your vasculature with exercise, and I'm probably sp stating this way too simply, um, working your vasculature during exercise is a very good thing. It, it maintains vascular function and moderating blood pressure under rested conditions and exercising conditions is like this complex thing that it seems to be helped by exercise. Yeah, that makes sense. I I have a layman's way to say it. I, I want to tell me if this is right, that the like the flexibility of your artery walls, like if you're fit, it's very flexible. Yes. And if you're not, it's stiff. And then your higher plasma volume, if it's stiff, is dangerous. But if you're fit and it's flexible, not a big deal because it goes, uh, it can expand and kind of like that hose expands and it doesn't increase the actual pressure. It's a good summary. So that's why, yeah, that's why it's okay. Uh, and then maybe too, that is potentially, I'm just guessing here, um, why <laughs> saunas and stuff raise your plasma volume and kind of, you know, expand those walls and kind of make them more flexible and exercise does it too. Um, and maybe that is one of the reasons of actually moving them physically. I have no clue on that. I just kind of thought of that 10 seconds ago and I have no clue. And I'm now embarrassed to <laughs> said it. <laughs> Consult no, with no, your legal I mean, professional. This, is what, this <laughs> is what you're supposed to. So this is the way this process works. So, so Nate, like just not, not. Not because uh, I'm trying to like save you from embarrassment. It, this this awkwardness is enjoyable in many ways, but it, uh, but it, no. So uh, the way you're thinking, There's so many more too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the way you're thinking critically there. Now the next step is uh, who's looking at that. And so, for example, there's a group at uh, University of Oregon that is on the cutting edge of understanding the health benefits of dry heat. And they're looking at it from a very mechanistic, uh, two years ago, I was at an American College of Sports Medicine meeting and I heard this gentleman talk and they have a lot of the best papers on this where dry heat is doing these things to the vasculature, these things to the plasma blood, because they're they're trying to understand the... the um, epidemiologic data we have where it's like, you, you know, in, in Finland, people that saunaed four times a week or more for, I think, at least 15 or 20 minutes had like some insane reduction in, in adverse cardiac events. Like we're talking in like the 30s, maybe close to 40% reduction in adverse cardiac events compared to people that didn't do that. And there's lots of stuff going on. There's a bunch of stuff going on at the cellular level with heat shock proteins, which seem to be very effective. Heat shock proteins are also activated during exercise and in the post-exercise state. So there's a multitude of things. And so where you went with that is, is how you're supposed to be thinking about these things critically. And then the next step is, I just thought of this 10 seconds ago, but I bet someone 
anyone has thought of it because there's just so many smart people and who's done the papers on it and who seems to be and where's the controversy and what does this group think and what does that group think and you know that's how science is supposed to work and this this kind of collective critical thinking is supposed to work so it's like you are on absolutely on the right track. We're actually working on having Dr. Minson on the podcast again uh, mm. soon. Um, from so, and Dr. Chris Minson, he's been involved with like a huge amount of those projects, like you're talking about there, um, yeah. Kyle. And so, and actually, it was great because I mentioned him on a podcast episode recently. And then he said, "Hey, man, you got a lot of stuff right. You got some stuff wrong. I want to come on." And I was like, "Great, <laughs> would, please, that yeah. would be fantastic." Yeah, that's the way um, it's supposed to work, right? Yeah, exactly. Natalie has a cool question. Uh, and this one I, we've gotten from a lot of different athletes. And I'm glad we have you to opine on this, Kyle, uh, and share your experience. Uh, Natalie says, I recently got some goo gels in a, and that's the brand goo, G U. Yeah. Goo gels in a goodie bag from a race and noticed that they advertise the amino acid content of their gels. I've never considered this before. And now find myself wondering why don't my other gels have amino acids or BCAAs? Why don't more gels and drink mixes have these in them to help offset, as we're talking, there's a bit of a logic leap here, I think in Natalie's question, uh, asking, why don't more gels and drink mixes have these in them to offset muscle damage? And I'm looking at like the goo gels and typically it tends to be somewhere around 1400 to 1400 and, or 1450, I think, on their milligram content for amino acids that they advertise in them. Uh, Kyle, we, we get this question from athletes in different contexts, though, where they're asking, like, should I be supplementing? You know, I'm making my own drink mix or I'm putting stuff together. Should I be adding BCAAs to stave off muscle damage? Because they can help repair is the, the logical thing. And the bro science bridge that we build in our minds goes in that direction. Yeah. So I guess uh, maybe it's best to just start with this thing and is that even effective when you're in an exercising state? Do BCAAs or amino acids even, do they help in any way? Maybe, but but <laughs> I don't find the evidence very convincing. I mean, like how much of this do you want to talk about in terms of BCAAs? Because you're, you're, some of, some of what you said in the which which wasn't included in Natalie's question is sort of this question about the role of BCAAs just in general. Natalie's question is super interesting in it because she's heard of BCAAs as offsetting muscle damage. So then the assumption is that taking BCAAs during the exercise is offsetting muscle damage, but it's not that part of the story isn't really what BCAAs do to potentially offset muscle damage. Um, and the the relationship between BCAAs and recovery is really during the recovery state, not during the exercise state. The relationship with BCAAs and how it pertains to performance while a person is exercising, super interesting. It's not very convincing. So like, which, how do you guys want to go about this in terms of unpacking the recovery part of it or the during exercise part of it or how that would apply? All of the above would be my answer. Um, uh, but like getting into the, maybe the background of like how they work maybe and how they repair. And then like you mentioned the two different states, like as we know, our body does things differently when it's in an active state versus a state in which it's recovering versus just a standard sedentary state. So first of all, what is this? So all of our proteins um, in our body are made up of different combinations of the same 20 amino acids. And those are not all the 20 amino, amino acids that exist. They're just the 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in our body. So the way I explain this to students is it's like uh, your proteins are the words and the amino acids are the letters of the alphabet. And it's different combinations of the same 26 letters make thousands of words and uh, it's different combinations of the same 20 amino acids that make thousands of different proteins in our body. Of those 20 amino acids, there are three that are called branch chain amino acids and that's just based off their organic structure. It's very easy. You can just Wikipedia and look at it and they'll show you because all, all, all amino acids have like a central carbon. They have a uh, nitrogen group. They they have a um, th what makes amino acids unique is that they they each have a unique what they call side chain or R group. So they have this unique side chain, and the differences in the side chain is what makes up the differences in the different amino acids. So there's three amino acids with these branched 
side chains, basically, this is the simplest way to put it. And so they call them BCAAs, and and they're valine, isovalene, and leucine. And originally, it was sort of there. There's some really unique metabolic. Um, effects of BCAAs. That's undeniable. There's very cool studies going back a really long way. And what my my kind of analysis uh, of the literature in these studies, it's really leucine is the most, seems to be the most bioactive one. And this is one of the reasons why you hear things like, you know, you may get a whey protein drink with added leucine, or it'll say things like BCAAs, and then you'll look. And, and whey protein already has a lot of leucine in it, which is one, it's probably one of the reasons why whey is is effective you know it's it's highly absorbed it it already has leucine in it and then some companies even add a little bit more added bcas or whatever so leucine is really interesting because they're under resting conditions there is a insulin independent molecular mechanism for leucine to turn on part of the molecular machinery that's responsible for protein synthesis so uh, some of you may have heard of mTOR and so uh, like mTOR is this central regulator of um, protein translation it's responsible it's it's kind of central to a lot of different things uh, for for anabolic processes and so we know that there are like multiple things that can turn on mTOR. Um, you, you know, there's growth hormone signaling, there's insulin signaling, there's different things like that. And, and amino acids seem to be able to do that independent of other things. So there is this unique mechanisms where, so then the idea is like, oh, well, if we can get like sugar in the system and protein in the system and branch chain amino acids in the system, we create this milieu that sort of optimizes this process of recovery. And, and there are some some like really interesting studies about, you know, sort of hypertrophy or, or strength gains or training adaptations or recovery and things like that in relation to both like protein intake, post-exercise protein intake, utilizing the anabolic window, and then adding BCAAs onto that. Where some of it gets convoluted for me is like, like people don't typically just take BCAAs in isolation. They're usually taking it with a bunch of other stuff. And so how much does it add in addition to the other stuff? And how do we tease that out? It's very difficult to, to tell, but there's no doubt that there is some physiologic plausibility for or some of the benefit to these things when, when you're talking about recovery. From an application standpoint, if everything else is in place and you're really trying to maximize recovery, one could argue that taking like pre-bed BCAAs may be like this clever way to get an increase in protein synthesis potentially overnight without putting like a bolus of food into the system or, or those types of things. And it would work in conjunction with like testosterone, growth hormone, and things like that that are elevated overnight. So there's this idea where you could possibly do that. I will say that taking powdered leucine and just putting it into water and trying to drink it is one of the most foul things like I've ever um, mm -hmm. tasted before. <laughs> you could, you guys can try it and report back. I don't know. Um, and And then also like... If you look at the profile, the protein profile breakdown, most most like quality whey supplements will have a protein profile breakdown. And there's actually like a lot of leucine in that already. And it's it's hard for me to know or put a percentage on what effect adding more BCAAs is to that. And you kind of get more bang for your buck with some other supplements. And so it's not something that I really typically try and like yeah, this is a non-negotiable one where we have to like, we have to add leucine, you know, because there's leucine in the meat that you eat. There's leucine in the other proteins that you get. And it's like, it's around. So that's kind of the recovery story from it. And that's where the story is from, from the, the muscle breakdown, the muscle damage, the muscle, that sort of stuff is that, that like, it does, it, there is this like plausible explanation for how it affects mTOR and when in conjunction, conjunction with other things, it could be contributing to like, I don't like using this term, but like enhanced recovery, or you're just trying to optimize recovery. You're, you're trying to like cross all the T's and dot all the I's. So that's, that's like one part of it. The other thing about BCAAs, there's only a couple studies th that have looked at this, but they're kind of interesting, which is that there's an idea that 
ingesting BCAAs during really long, long efforts, so ultra efforts, can reduce central fatigue. And the mechanism that they think is th- that is happening here is that branched chain amino acids compete with tryptophan to cross the blood brain barrier. And tryptophan is the precursor for serotonin. And serotonin production may be related to some central fatigue after we have been exercising for really long periods of time. So the story goes, if you ingest BCAAs, it competes with tryptophan, there's less tryptophan that makes it into your blood and or into your brain across the blood brain barrier, and you have less. This is my understanding of this story as it stands right now. Like, I reserve the right to change my opinion on this or my <laughs> understanding on this, but basically, the story that I've kind of seen in the literature and what's been presented is that that in some instances people have like basically reduced feelings of central fatigue by ingesting BCAAs based on this proposed mechanism of preventing tryptophan from getting across the blood brain barrier and that is impacting central fatigue from that standpoint there's a study waiting to be done where you could potentially ingest a certain amount of bcaas leading into a really really hard effort with the idea that you might be able to like create that competition and reduce the amount of tryptophan in your blood for when you're gonna go super hard so there's something there that's kind of interesting uh the reality is is that like but but you're talking about like pretty big doses of in the gram ranges to like more than what is in these gels. And so I know that yeah. like there's other drinks out there that throw some BCAs in there. Um, I think uh, this seems to be a goo thing because goo is roctane, right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure there's some BCA. They 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 have some name for it. It's like amino something complex or branched amino complex or something. And so they're 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 putting that stuff in their drinks and in their gels. And I'm skeptical in terms of the level of effectiveness. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand on it. Does it seem like something that would hurt digestion or cause any negative effects? For some people, big time. Yeah, for some mm-hmm. people. A lot. Like I've had several uh, recreational athletes, for example, say, uh, well, I showed up at the, and this is kind of a rookie, uh, like this was in the early days where it was like, you just show up and assume you'll drink whatever they serve at the aid station. And all of a sudden it's sponsored by this thing that has an amino acid blend and they're, they've been drinking carbohydrate mixes all training and then all of a sudden they start sipping on this stuff so yeah i think there's some implications there but i think it's going to be highly dependent on the individual i wouldn't want to just make a blanket statement because some people do really well off roctane and goo but i think it's more of like an afterthought than the reason why they're doing well with it that's my opinion yes yeah, so this doesn't seem like something that um and I, actually one thing if you can clearly explain like the the muscle rebuild thing we talked all about yeah. how they can help you recover that sort of thing but why would it not reduce muscle damage when you're in an active state i think that's a key point to touch on it it depends on how you're interpreting the data from a mechanistic standpoint so from my interpretation again i reserve the right to have this to like this is my opinion on on <laughs> assessing the data if the main effect of leucine is happening at mtor and mTOR is sort of the one of the central regulators or one of the key. I mean, we're getting away from the idea of central regulators for certain things. But if at a molecular level, mTOR is really important for protein synthesis, protein synthesis just isn't turned on while we're exercising. Did you guys read, I uh, can't remember if it's sports gene or if it's um, one. the the other one, Endure. Um, but in one of those yeah. books, there's an example of sled dogs that adapt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they actually, they undergo protein synthesis and adapt to exercise in real time while they're exercising, which is like blows my mind. I think it's so cool. So That'd they get rad. fit That's while crazy. they're exercising. They'll- 
they also have a VO two max of like two hundred and twenty or two forty, yeah. something so, like yeah. that. Yeah, so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? You start and, running, you just get go faster and faster and faster. <laughs> yeah. It's like Forrest yeah, Gump the first like, time. You're like, just Whoa. laying down <laughs> tissue that's making you faster while you're actually doing the thing. Humans are not like that. We 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 kind of transition between catabolic state and anabolic state, and so I think people are confusing sometimes muscle breakdown with muscle synthesis, muscle protein synthesis, and they're not seeing that it's an equation that has balance on either side. So this is why when they when they talk about protein, like in 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 the uh, research, when you talk about uh, protein, you talk about protein turnover. And protein turnover, you're talking about, well, what is the protein degradation and what's the protein synthesis and where's the balance in that? And if you have more synthesis than degradation, you get your gains uh, at, with a Z. And, uh, and, and if you're, if you have more breakdown than synthesis, you're in negative protein balance. And if you're weight stable and, um, you're maintaining your muscle mass and you're in protein balance. So the main, my main understanding of the way BCAs work is, is by turning on, helping to turn on mTOR, which would contribute to the protein synthesis standpoint. And if that leads to gains or it leads to less breakdown, it's not because it's blunting the breakdown down it's because it's it's contributing to the to the synthesis side of that uh swimming pool or equ equation so the way to visualize this is like think about a swimming pool with an inflow and an outflow and if the inflow increases and the outflow decreases you get a rate rise in the pool level so positive protein synthesis if they're matched the pool stays level and if the outflow or the protein breakdown is out competing the inflow then the level starts to drop and so if if the level staying the same or the level increases, you could mistake that for being a decrease in the outflow when actually it's an increase in the inflow. Um, yeah, makes sense. Whereas things like beta hydroxymethylbutyrate, for example, uh, which is sold as a supplement under the acronym HMB, there's some evidence that that does uh, act on the on the breakdown to blunt the breakdown side of things. So that would be something where I would say it's slowing down the the decrease, which could give you the the perception that you're more likely ended up in positive protein balance. Because anytime we work out, we're gonna have some muscle protein breakdown. Um, and we want to be careful about using the word damage. Like I know there is some damage in the sense that there's there's like stress and stimulus, but a lot of times that quote unquote damage is a really important signal for adaptation. And that's the whole idea, right? Is that we stress the system with a particular stimulus and then the system overdoes the response to that. And that's why we have super compensation and that has served us really well from an evolutionary standpoint. We are super adaptable. So we stress the system um, the body senses those signals in a variety of ways and then it overdoes the response to them and that's how we get gains. The whole point is, is like, to me, the, the protein turnover uh, story, the, the evidence suggests that we actually get our gains on a workout by workout basis. And as we get into shape, it's not that we're stressing the muscles less or improving our ability to recover. We've increased our capacity to stress the system, but the breakdown and the response are very similar. And what you're trying to do is maximize the difference between those two things while also providing the training signals that are important. And then once that difference and once recovery has taken place from that workout, that brick is on the building, that brick is stacked. And so it's the accumulation of of those over time that leads to big fitness changes. It's not like you get more out of a workout after you've trained for two months than you do at the beginning. It's just mm -hmm. that you're capable of stimulating the system to a greater degree because you've stacked all those bricks over two months. And so the BCAA and like muscle damage, for me, that doesn't totally add up. It's more of we're trying to maximize the synthesis side of it to create a bigger difference so we get more out of that training session. And that muscle protein synthesis is something Something that is going to be happening post training, not going to be post training. Happening yeah, precisely. When you're training. Yeah. 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 Which kind of recaps. And it's that going to be point. regulated by nutrition. You know, I tell athletes all the time, like your your recovery drink is not the end of recovery. It's literally the start of recovery. It's it's the signal that starts the process of adapting to that session. And that recovery takes 48 to 72 hours, probably. And so you you know, when you're thinking about programming, you, you know, you kind of have to build that on 
understanding into to how you program it, how often you're stimulating the same system in the same way. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. That BCAA one and protein during training is probably one of the more common nutrition questions that we've gotten over. I looked back through and over the past two years, we've gotten it many times uh, from from different athletes. So those um, those studies are I, I so intriguing, though, right? Sorry, the, those the, oh yeah, idea mechanism man you could take makes you excited, right? Like the the idea that you could take BCAAs and somehow reduce feeling like sh- like is just so enticing, <laughs> like that. The idea of central fatigue and taking these things, I would love to see more studies on that topic because I think it's really interesting. And the mechanism is also super fascinating. That whole like blood brain barrier and gateway theory and th- those are really interesting. And so I was super pumped when I saw that question because I think it's it's something that is kind of interesting and that I don't think we ha- totally have figured out as a collective. Yeah. Nate, do you have anything else to, to add? Yeah, we got through two questions this time. So <laughs> PR. Our, we've li- laid some bricks. Yeah. <laughs> we so give it to me. Just give it like to we, me from we, an, we, give it to me from signal, an average right? standpoint. That's a hundred percent improvement. Yeah. Like we've <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. It's incredible. The fastest rate of improvement of any podcast get guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Kyle, thanks yeah, a bunch, man. I'm glad that you could join us. And for those uh for those joining, if we if we talked over each other or everything else, we're we're sorry if that happened. It's it's a lot of latency. We've got to figure it out here. We appreciate you so much. Uh go check out with Kyle on Instagram. We'll link him down in the, the comments below. Uh he's got lots of athletes going to the Olympic trials and stuff. So we'll talk about that, I'm sure, the next time he's on. And we'll talk to you all next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. Really appreciate it.